live now and it's there's a latency and okay we are now live andrew why don't you introduce our special guest today thanks all right so hi everybody uh gcast is very happy to be with mariana b ganapini today originally from milan uh, she is currently the assistant professor of philosophy at Union College, a researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute, and a For Humanity Fellow. She has numerous peer-reviewed publications, and she is currently working on several projects on disinformation and content moderation. Thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. So um, th thank you. Th thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to share my screen. So... Let me see. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll be with you in a second. Okay, here we go. So today I want to talk a little bit about the ethics of technology. Um, and I'm a philosopher by training, so the kind of approach that I'm going to take is so mainly philosophical, and I'm interested in understanding how philosophy can have an impact on, um, on the various issues that, that we face with technology. And so what I'm going to do is sort of give you an overview of what's going on, what's going on in the ethics of technology field. And at the end, I hope to be able to sort of point to some possible solutions for the problems that I'm going to raise. Um, so um, let me give you an overview of what ethics is. Being a philosopher, I think that we should start, if not with some definitions, at least with some descriptions of what we're going to talk about. So. Um, Ethics and applied ethics are sort of slightly different disciplines. Ethics studies the principles and sort of determines what we are required or permitted to do and why we are required and permitted to do it. So not just the what, not just the content, not just indications of what we ought or may do, but also why, the reasons why we are required or permitted to do it. And as such, philosophy, uh, sorry, ethics and philosophical ethics, they address things like questions like what value, uh, what values should guide my actions or my life? Where are my duties? How should I live? And it's important to understand that when we think about ethics, we should always remember that it's not just a matter of conforming to those principles and conforming to those rules and duties. It's also a matter of the reason why we conform. So ethical behavior is not just about checking boxes. Ethical behavior has to do with the motivation behind our actions. So not just a matter of conformity, but also the matter of why, or why we do the things that we do. Now, this is sort of ethics in general. Now, applied ethics, um, what it does is applies these general principles and ideas to some practical problems and to establish norms and standards that should guide our actions within those sort of practical issues. And so applied ethics are things like bioethics, uh, business ethics, and ethics of tech. Ethics of tech in particular, since that's what we're going to talk about today, concern the values and principles that guide, that guide our conduct in the development and use of new technologies. Okay, so this is sort of an overview of what, of what we're going to uh, look at today. Mm, some people talk about AI ethics, other people talk about ethics of technology. Um, Today, I want to sort of uh, refer to the, the broader issue, which is the ethics of tech. I, uh, artificial intelligence ethics, AI ethics, 
is part of the ethics of tech. So giving again some definitions to sort of get us started, we think about ethics as the sum of ideas and artifacts and methods used to change our environment and our ways of living, okay? AI is part of ethics, uh, sorry, it's part of, of, of tech, and is the type of technology that aims at building autonomous, autonomous systems able to think in a human-like fashion. So um, I think that we should think of AI ethics as part of a larger issue of the ethics of tech. <clears throat> So being a philosopher again, I'm being a philosopher again, what I, what I, when I think about ethics, I always sort of refer back to the sort of main moral theories uh, that we find in philosophy. And I think that's what, what's, also gonna, what's also happening in the uh, ethics of technology field. So we are gonna talk about some of the principles that guide um, ethics of tech, but they sort of all derive from these main ideas that philosophers have been thinking about for a while now. And so here I have a list of those sort of the main moral theories that you're probably all sort of familiar with. And, and so these theories provide the background, provide the, the framework that um, allow ethics of technology and AI ethics to be able to sort of derive fundamental principles that are useful to guide um, our practice. So famously, we have deontological theories, we have consequentialist theories, we have virtual ethics kind of approach, social contract theory, right-based ethics, common good. We also have religious ethics and moral sort of relativism. These are sort of the overview of the main ethical theories you find out there. But from these ethical theories, the um, ethics of tech has sort of used some sort of key concepts. The key concepts that I think have been sort of predominant in the um, ethics of tech are fairness, well being, rights, and common good. Okay. So the idea of fairness comes from, from a number of, the, of these moral theories and sort of refers to the idea that um, people should have equal opportunities. The idea of well-being really sort of derives from the virtue ethics approach and stresses the fact that um, we should promote well-being and flourishing for, <clears throat> for humans. Similarly, the idea of rights derived from, well, both Kantian ethics and the rights space approaches um, as the idea of common good derives from the more consequentialist approach to ethics that pushes us to think about ethics as um, what is good not just for one individual but for the larger community okay so as as a background we have these theories but then when we do um, ethics of tech we, we really want to sort of derive some key principles that allow us to be able to um, really frame the kind of uh, reasoning and the kind of ethical conduct that we want. And so this is what, what you get, okay? I'm just here, I mentioned some of the principles. There are probably many more, there are definitely many more, but still I wanna get you started on the idea that there are sort of a sort of a consensus in the community uh, and in the space of ethics of, of tech and AI ethics in particular, uh, which is sort of converging um, around this, this, this few principles. <clears throat> you probably recognize here that these principles take a lot from the moral theories that I was mentioning before. So you have the idea of benevolence, um, it's very much the idea of promoting well-being and flourishing. So this part of an ethical approach, the idea that, um, that we should promote and allow humans and possibly also the environment to 
to flourish in a certain way. That is the sort of a duty of ours. That is a that's something that we are we ought to do to promote the well-being of, of human beings, of society, and of the environment. Okay. On the other hand, we should also not um, you should also avoid any kind of harm. And that's where the, the principle of non-maleficence sort of derives from. Then you have justice and fairness, which is really the idea of guaranteeing inclusivity and equal opportunities, which is absolutely key in the, in the ethics of AI in particular. There is the idea of rights, okay, which um, is, is very important. And there is a particular aspect in the, in the notion of right, which is the notion of autonomy, which is basically the idea that people should be allowed to kind of make their own choices, okay, roughly, or determine their, their, their own actions, um, self-determine, and be sort of free to choose their own path, be put in the right conditions to be free to choose their own path, and so on and so on. So the idea of I'm sort of bringing together the idea of rights and autonomy as sort of a, two, similar, two things that are very similar and going in the same direction. Now, last, we have explainability and accountability. So explainability is a little of an odd term here because it's not necessarily a normative term as rights or justice, but is as important as we will see in the, in the ethics of tech, okay? Because the idea is that in order for all these other things to take place, benevolence, justice, fairness, rights, and so on and so forth, you need a system that is understandable. You need in particular an, an AI system that is understandable by, by those who are using it and by those who are affecting, affected by it. So the idea of explainability is actually absolutely key to make sense of the rest of the, of the entire ethical framework. And it goes along with the idea of accountability. Um, so we, we need to be able to hold um, AI systems, technological companies responsible, but as to do that, we need to understand what they did. So they, there has to be a degree of transparency. So, What's gonna happen now that I'm gonna give you some examples in which um, sort of these ethical principles have, um, have faced some challenges in relation to, to technology. And I wanna start with something that is not um, uh, kind of usually as prominent in the AI ethics as, as I think it should be. Uh, and so I want to start with sort of something that are not necessarily related to AI, but it's more related to tech in general. Technology, well, we know uh, that we, we use social media a lot. Social media are very, very important. So I think it's becoming more and more important for us to th start think ethically about uh, social media and their role in our society. Now, of course, there is a lot of work in this area. So, and the work has been done in relation to two main issues. The first issue has to do with the, uh, with the relation between social media and mental health or depression. So there is a, quite a bit of research and rightly so on studying the relation that um, social or the impact that social media can have on mental well-being, mental health, depression, especially in uh, the case of teenagers. And I think that's absolutely sort of important. So there's, and, and I applaud that there's quite a bit of work on that, just trying to figure out if there's any causal link between, between the two. Another area that is very popular, especially uh, nowadays, is the link between social media, disinformation and hate speech, okay? So there is a lot of talk about the impact of social media on, on our democracy, the impact on social, of social media on the spread of hate speech, on the spread of disinformation. And of course, there's a quite a bit of focus on the question, should social media platforms be held responsible for what's online? Should they be held responsible for, their, for the content moderation? Should be really required to do content moderation and so on and so forth. So very important. But what I, what I wanna sort of 
focus a little bit more, which I think has not been really kind of touched much um, upon, is the, the question of, the more general question of, okay, but even if it turns out that social media doesn't, does not have a direct impact on um, our mental health, and if it, even if it turns out that we are going to be able to somehow stop this information and stop hate speech, do we still want social media to have the role that it has in our lives? In other words, what I think it's important is to, as an ethicist is to try to step back from this very important problems and also think about what is the impact of social media on our well-being as a society, independently of depressions or hate speech and disinformation. What role do we want um, for social media to have in our society? What kind of society we want, okay, going forward? And, and is social media stifling or promoting um, our well-being, our flourishing, okay? So I think this is an important question that needs, needs more, more space. So this is sort of an example of how already you can see how tech can, can, can kind of conflict with the principles, the moral principle we just talked about before. But there are other cases, there are other examples that are even sort of uh, even more relevant, more obvious, okay? And so I'm gonna just give you one, one very prominent example of how technology in particular, um, artificial intelligence can, put pressure, a lot of pressure on, on the, our ethical, ethical beliefs and our ethical principles. And it's the case of what's called algorithmic injustice. So um, at first, when, when we thought that we could use algorithms, when we thought we could use um, AI to make decisions, important decisions, we thought that, well, it's going to be great, right? Because we all know how humans are um, irrational, biased. Uh, so if we take humans, if you will, out of the picture, or at least if we insert an autonomous system in the decision-making process, we guarantee objectivity. We guarantee um, a certain degree of value neutrality. Turns out that was, that was not the case. That's not the case at all. Algorithms and, and AI are, are not value neutral at all. And so instead of trying to find um, a value neutral AI, what we need to be doing is to think more about the kind of values that it, we want AI to add. Okay. And and these are not the value of injustice. This is going to be the value of justice and fairness. So I'm going to give you here a very famous example. So you're probably aware of it already, but just just give you some kind of practical kind of context and practical example. You can so you can understand what what I'm referring to. So this is something that happened a few years ago uh, at Amazon. The company was experimenting uh, with a hiring tool uh, using AI. When, when the company realized at one point that the new system was not uh, fair at all. In fact, um, the new system, it was actually discriminating against women. So this is because the, the Amazon computer models were trained to vet applicants by observing patterns in resumes that were given to the system and those resume were the resumes submitted to the company over 10 years. Okay. So because of the nature, if you will, of the tech industry, most of the resumes came from men. Okay. And because of that, the AI basically taught itself or made an inference that male candidates were preferable. So when now the AI is asked to evaluate um, women candidates, the, the system is going to discriminate against, against those resumes, okay? So this is a very sort of important example because it tells you how 
a certain tendency, uh, the biases that you can find in our society can be learned and implemented by the AI system, producing a result as in fact totally unjust and, and, and unfair and discriminating, okay? So what we need to th really think about now is that we need an AI system that is careful enough. We need, as we design AI system, as we train that AI system, we need to be careful that the set of data that we offer uh, the system is, is representative, not just of one section of the population, but is representative of everyone, okay? That is, in other words, inclusive, which is, which is proven very, very difficult. And this example, so illuminates, but it's only one example of many, many cases in which AI turned out to be unfair and unjust, okay? Need to keep that in mind. So this is, as, 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 as we we're talking about sort of ethical principles, we're talking about justice and fairness, and this is a case where AI is in, at times, at times in conflict with those, with those values. But there are other cases, and sort of, I wanna sort of move to a different kind of set of principles uh, referring to the idea of a right. So here's the term, we talk about justice, but what about rights? Well, one might think, one of our fundamental rights is privacy, okay? So how is technology affecting our privacy? Well, it's affecting in, in, in many different ways. And it's no, no news for uh, anyone that AI can really be problematic, uh, and technology in general can really be problematic when it comes to preserving privacy. But here I wanna talk a little bit more, more about that. How, is, how are data breaches, for instance, um, a cause of harm? How can they harm us uh, by disclosing information about ourselves? So I kind of, I have three, three uh, sets of, um, if you will, um, types of harms that can relate to and be derived from data breaches. The first one is probably the one we all familiar with, which is disclosure of personal, personal data, right? And that means basically that your data, your information gets disclosed in a way that you're not comfortable with. Okay, your privacy is violated. And there are three ways in which this can happen. The first one is may perhaps the most um, obvious or, or, or at least the pop, the most, like everybody kind of is familiar with it, which is the, the problem of data leaks. So we had that with Yahoo, we had that uh, with Marriott. So what happens is that basically your data and your information gets stolen by someone, okay? And there is a leak. And what's yours, what's, what's your information is, is, is divulged in a way that you're not comfortable with by means of a sort of a physical stealing, okay. The second case is, it's what's called data dissemination, which is not necessarily about stealing your data. It's simply like, uh, there's a company that has your data, your information, and they feel comfortable, they feel okay selling that information to someone else. And that might not be even illegal at all. That's the case that happened with Facebook, taking your information, taking your likes, taking your posts, taking, and giving all that set of data to another company to use as they say fit, okay? Again, this is not a matter of stealing anything, it's just a matter of you, you put some information out there and it's given to someone else. There's a third case though, which is um, also very important. So one of, the re one of the ways in which you might think, well, to preserve privacy, you need to anonymize, okay? So we have a data set, you don't wanna be, <clears throat> you don't wanna have um, the names or gender or, or email addresses of the people involved uh, divulged, so you kind of anonymize it, okay? Turns out anonymization is not the best way to go uh, to, to preserve privacy. It can be very tricky because we, are, we have access to many, 
data sets. And if you sort of combine and, and use different set data set, data sets, what, what can happen is that you can actually de-anonymize what was anonymized. So if I combine a bunch of different data sets, I can actually kind of basically reverse engineer the names or the sensitive information of the people who are actually anonymized, okay? This is sort of obviously harmful, okay? Because it's a clear, obvious violation of your right. But there are other ways in which data breaches can be problematic. Um, and so I wanna move to what I call personal data inferences. I'm gonna sort of read a quote from, from a uh, fantastic paper by Watcher and, and, and others. Um, um, and, and they write, inferential analytics methods, they say, are used to infer user preferences <clears throat> sensitive attributes and opinions or to predict behaviors. So what they're saying is that it is possible to infer, and the, the notion of inference is key here, infer a lot about you, who you are, who you like, what kind of uh, party you vote for, based on information that you put yourself online. Uh, freely thinking, not, not even thinking about the posts that you posted on Facebook, the, the likes, the, the, the tweets, the photos that you posted on a website, the, the articles that you share on, on Twitter, all that data is out there to be, to be used, okay? You might not think that there's any link between all these things, but it's in fact possible to draw a set of inferences from, from, the, from, that, from that set of data and make um, assessments about you, your personality, your character, whether you are you know, a punctual person or not, whether you turn things on time, where you, you know, pay your taxes and all that. All this sort of inference can be drawn and of course, this kind of inference are, inferences are privacy invasive, reputation damaging, but there is another issue that I think is, is somehow, somehow not um, enough, not stressed enough. It's the idea that these inferences can actually draw a picture about you, tell, tell a story about your, uh, you and you that you are not necessarily agree with, okay? They're gonna, they're gonna paint a picture about your, um, your flaws that you might not agree with. So in a, in a way, it's a, it's a way to know you through your data, but it's not necessarily a, a realistic or, or accurate picture of yourself. So not only is this privacy invasive, it's also undermining your autonomy as, a, as, a, as an agent. It turns out that data protection law is, is meant to protect privacy, identity, and reputation and autonomy, but they point out, these authors point out that it's currently failing to protect data subjects from the risk of what's called inferential analytics. In other words, people are not protected from the kind of harm that derives from this kind of inferences that are drawn from data found online. Okay, about them, about that. Okay, so that's, that can be extremely, extremely harmful. And there's a sort of a third way in which privacy can privacy violations can be harmful, and and, and you probably see in this case um, in the in the news. This is a case in which accessing your data can lead to um, unfair and biased decisions. So something that I uh, that I it's also always uh, important to stress and mention is that. A lot of the inferences that are drawn from, from data about you are gonna um, inform decisions made about you. Decision about whether to grant you a loan, whether to grant you parole, okay? And, and, and these kind of decisions are oftentimes unfair and biased, okay? And here's an example of that. Um, it was a few months ago, the international Baccalaureate, uh, it's a global program that awards a prestigious um, diploma to students in addition 
to the diploma they received uh, they received from their from their high school. Okay, so they had this uh, to grant this diploma. Unfortunately, they had to um, cancel the in-person exams because of the pandemic, of course. So what they thought is like instead of you know students have the take the exam, we could have a system, okay, an algorithm, infer, predict actually, the student's grade, what they would have taken uh, as a grade, um, where do they gotten as a grade in, in, that, in that exam, based on information that we know about them, okay? The schools of the school they went to, the grades they got to, uh, the activities they were involved, and so on and so forth. So they collected that data, the, the set of data, and from that they made an inference the resulted in a grade, okay? That of course turned out to be a, a kind of a terrible idea because the results were unfair. Students coming from less prestigious schools, although they were excellent students, they actually got very low grades for, for no obvious reason. So, the, the fact that we, uh, that we sort of allowed an, um, an AI system to make inference about data, so from data uh, taken from, from, from us, led to decisions that were actually harmful. And, and, and so again, here's an example of how violation of privacy on the one hand and the use of an algorithm system that is biased can lead to very, very harmful. Uh, effects. Okay. So, uh, sort of, so far, I've given you some uh, examples of how things can go terribly wrong in technology, how we can um, end up having um, unfair and unjust and harmful uh, decision being made. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the issue of. Um, transparency and explainability. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned at one point before, I said, well, transparency by itself is, is, an, is not a normative term, okay? But it seems that the idea of transparency is key in order for us to address all the issues that I've sort of mentioned. And by the way, I only mentioned really a couple of things, but there is so much out there. So I haven't touched on many, many, many of the ways in which uh, tech can go, can go terribly, terribly wrong. But definitely transparency seems to be absolutely important, okay? The problem that transparency is also extremely hard to get. So let me explain what the problem with transparency is, why it's so important and why it's so hard, so hard to get. So if you have a system, if, we, if you wanna ensure that a system, especially a system that is using artificial intelligence, you wanna ensure that it's uh, fair and preserves your rights and promotes well-being and so on and so forth, you kind of have to know, more or less many people think, you kind of have to know how it works, okay? So, one of the problems with that we saw, we just saw with the exam and the, the grades that were given based on, on basically past performance was that it wasn't so obvious and so clear how those grades were uh, sort of the, what, what, what mechanism, okay? What kind of inferences were used to arrive to those kind of grades, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't clear at all. And that made people feel as they were uh, wronged and they made it made people feel uh, as if their own autonomy was um, in a sense uh, weakened okay they weren't able to actually you know take the exam and do as 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 they could they were assessed in a way that in such a way that their own freedom their, their own capacity their own ability to self-determination was in a sense extremely limited and, and basically destroyed. So we call the problem of transparency, the problem of the, the black box, okay? Because in the minute that you have a system that gets a set of data and then gives you an output, but it's unclear how 
you go from the input to the output, you have a, you have a system that is hard to vet, hard to, um, to monitor, and then it's very, very hard to hold that system accountable, okay? So accountability and, and, and design and ethics, they all require a certain degree of transparency. And it's clear that transparency is, is needed for those who are sort of the, the recipients, okay? For those who are affected by the decisions made, made by the system, as in the case of those students who were basically discriminated against. Um, but it's also important, transparency is also important for the users. So here I'm thinking about the case of um, a doctor that, I, that is using an AI system uh, to make diagnosis. Okay, so we have that a lot. Uh, and, and it's a field that is rapidly um, developing the use of AI in making, for instance, breast cancer sort of diagnosis, okay? Skin cancer diagnosis. So the minute that you can use a system to kind of see, well, a doctor might not be able to see, well, that's great, isn't it? So the doctor, if you will, is the user uh, of the system, of the AI system. The problem though, is that the doctor might not have the right skills to actually understand the system itself. So the system delivers a certain kind of assessment results and so on, but the doctor itself doesn't really know how, how it got there, how the system got there. So not only um, the recipients of, of that assessment can be harmed, but there is a sense in which the user itself lacking any knowledge and understanding of what's going on uh, in the machine, if you will, lacking any insight on the inferential process that got the machine from the input to the output, the user itself can be harmed in his ability or her ability to, to make assessments that are robust. Okay, so there, that's why there is such a call for transparency, such a call from, for um, interpretability. A quick thing, a quick distinction between interpretability and transparency. Transparency itself gives you hopefully access to the main inner workings of a system. But it's a different thing to actually be able to understand the system. Okay, so again, take a case of a doctor. The doctor might be uh, might be very difficult for the doctor to actually understand the system because it doesn't have the or her doesn't she doesn't have the right skills. Okay, so many people are calling for a more transparent and more understandable or explainable AI. However, that might be harder than we thought because of the technical difficulties, but also um, because of issues such as. Um, the fact that there is, there are some limitation to the things that we can actually understand about an AI system and because of intellectual property issues, okay? So I, so far I talked about many of the, uh, how things can go wrong, but let me mention two final ways in which things can get actually even harder. There are other challenges that we face beyond the actual technical difficulties and, and implementations and, and transparency and all that, there are other like intrinsic problems that we had when we face uh, in an AI system that um, we, want it, we want to be trans trustworthy, okay? We face what's called ethical dilemmas, oftentimes, or at least trade-offs. In other words, there are situations in which you have things like, fairness, you want to ensure fairness, you want to ensure justice on the one hand, but that might lead you to violate privacy. So you want to, for instance, you want to have a system that is, that is fair and just, so you want to make sure that your design is, is kind of guarantees or at least um, helps you get a system that is more, that is more just. Um, you want to vet that system, you might need to take into account 
um, important sort of variables such as gender or race, but taking those, thinking, those things into account might lead to a possible violation of the privacy of, of those involved, okay? So uh, there, might, there might be situations in other words in which you're gonna have to choose between fairness and privacy. Another example that is often mentioned is the trade-off between privacy and accuracy. So there is a technique called differential privacy that allows you to, you know, preserve the privacy uh, of those involved, um, especially sort of uh, limiting the risk of de-anonymization. But the more of differential privacy you use, the less accurate your system might end up being. So often time talk, people talk, talk, talk about a trade-off between privacy and accuracy, okay? Another issue that is extremely problematic is perhaps the most difficult issue that we, we are facing now with, in, the, in the ethics um, of technology and the ethics of AI in particular, is the problem of going from theories and principles which are abstract, okay, which are quite vague and quite broad, going from those principles to actual practical places, okay, what it's called, what, we, what we're struggling with is called operationalizing it. So going from principles to actual practical situation, implementing those principles. And things are extremely slippery and extremely difficult when it comes to AI because of the constant changes in the, the technology, because of the variability of the context. Some, the, the same system may be harmful to some communities, for instance, and not others. So the variability, the contextual dependency of, 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 the, of the very notion of very notions such as harm or, or right, um, those have very important implication when it comes to actually open, open like, I'm um, sorry, actually sort of implement those theories and principles, okay? So these are sort of on top of the other difficulties we also face these ethical dilemmas and the problem of going from theory to practice. So what are the solutions? <clears throat> well, it's, uh, <laughs> It's very hard to, to find a solution that um, always work or that works for everyone. But so here's my, um, my take on it. Here's my the suggestions that, that I have. Is that if we wanna find um, ways to build a more trustworthy AI, if you wanna find ways to um, build a more ethical AI, ethical technology, we need four things, okay? And it all, I think everything starts from the center, what I have in the center, which is, which is research, okay? Um, a type of research that is interdisciplinary. Uh, and by that, I mean, the kind of research that is not afraid of um, putting different disciplines together and trying to see what, what comes out of it, okay? And that includes philosophy, but it also includes, of course, computer science, it includes anthropology, it includes sociology, uh, and, and more, law. So we need to do more research on the effects that these technologies have and therefore we need psychology as well to see, for instance, the impact that social media have, um, social media companies, social media use have on, on our well-being, for instance, as I mentioned at the beginning. We need to, we need research to figure out what are the best ways to ensure uh, fairness in, in our AI. So in other words, we shouldn't be afraid to um, listen to as many voices as possible when it comes to research coming from very different, different disciplines. And even more importantly, I think that this research needs to be inclusive. 
we gotta give voice to those communities that usually do not have a voice. We need to look at the impact and research on the impact that tech has on those communities that are usually don't, cannot express, okay, their concerns. Uh, because they are also impacted by, by technology. Technology, uh, this is trivial, technology is really impacting everyone. And there are, a group, there are groups of people that, whose voices are not heard, are not part of the conversation at all, okay? So we gotta be listening more and doing more research uh, on those communities. And research, leads to, I think, and, and helps with everything with everything else. And what is what is the rest? The rest is what you have on, it's on my, my left, a auditing and legal framework. framework. We don't have laws uh, yet. They are really ensuring uh, a more, more fair and, and, and trustworthy AI. We need an auditing system that gives us confidence Okay, that we can trust um, AI and the technology that we use every day. Okay, so we we definitely need to put more 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 resources in that. On the other hand, we need to bring developers and investors into the conversation about about ethics. We need to allow them to be trained in ethics. We need to be uh, to allow them to um, to really develop a certain degree of sensibility when it comes to ethical issues through things like um, AI ethics curricula, for instance. So we need more AI ethics curricula. We need um, more voices that are part of that kind of conversation, and 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 this definitely include include people that are actually designing those technologies they, technologies they need to be they need to be part of that conversation uh, last but not least actually that's absolutely prominent is the role of stakeholders and uh, the role of the public okay so we need to develop civic confidence we need to um, ensure public engagement and this is this is the work that the Montreal AI Ethics Institute is doing um, I think really, really well to try to build city confidence. The public needs to be aware of the problems that AI faces and technology in general, because this is gonna put pressure, I think, and not just put pressure, but also inform the legal framework and the kind of sort of expectations that we are gonna have as a public. Um, about how companies are gonna behave um, when it comes to ethics uh, in relation to sort of the, the technology that they are developing, okay? So although research is sort of the starting point, what really what we really need is a strong, strong civic confidence. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was fantastic. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Kevin. Question time. So, um, the first question is coming from uh, Helen Rigglesworth, and um, it's really put into two. Uh, the first part is um, Does AI lose its ability to be judged if it's being programmed by humans? And um, the second part of that is, um, are people being secretly turned into digital beings, perhaps from that uh, knowing that humans are the creators? So, um, um, let me, so does it? That's, I, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm sort of looking at the first part. Um, does, does AI lose its right to be judged as it's programmed by, by humans? I think, I think no, actually, I, I hope the opposite. Um, I think that the, that we have a duty to, to judge uh, AI. We have a duty to try to, um, hold 
AI systems accountable because they are the result of um, human design. So there, there are at least two things that we need to keep uh, track of when we talk about, about this. AI needs, um, needs data and the kind of data that, that is available uh, and is given is, is you derives from, from, from us. Okay, it derives from, from humans. And, and so all the, the, all the biases, all the imperfections, all the trends that you're gonna find in human behavior and human way of thinking risk to be, are, 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 are likely to be um, transferred to an AI system are likely to be learned by an AI system and are likely to be implemented by an AI, the AI system. And that, and that, cuts, that kinda puts us in a, in, a, in, a, in a bind, so to speak, if you will. Because on the one hand, we have a set of kind of human limitations and human biases. I mean, we know we are biased and we know we are um, sort of cognitively uh, irrational in many, many ways. And so our societies are far from, from perfect. So on the one hand, you have that. And on the other hand, you have a system that is supposed to be better and, and more rational and not like uh, guided by emotions or, 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 or by uh, biases of various kind. They actually ends up being as biased and as unjust as the human society or the humans that actually program there. Sorry, I designed it. So, um, so the the hope is that we first of all we become aware of that, uh, and that's why we need research, we need studies, we need transparency as, as much as possible. Although it's not going to be uh, not every, it's impossible that everything's going to be transparent, but we need more of that for sure. On the one hand, and on the other hand, we we need to be tracking. Uh, all the ways in which things can go can go wrong. Okay, and so framing things in terms of general principles is good, but we also need very specific guidelines, and that's where like uh, the auditing system can really help. We need specific guidelines. We need questions that we need to be able to ask uh, to developers and companies regarding their systems knowing that these questions may lead to find out um, that there are in fact um, ethical, ethical risks and ethical challenges in those systems. So research, but also holding, holding these companies accountable as much as possible. So, so this was my, the, the answer to the first question. You said there was another question? Yeah, it's sort of a, a part two, at least from my own uh, my own intuition, and it's something that the interaction of people, let's say the auditors, the people working in the systems, uh, everything, they're having to analyze these, um, well, this AI so much that I think Helen really poses something interesting that if you're analyzing all of this stuff, are you not also becoming yourself a more digitized being? I see, I see, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's probably what's gonna happen. But I think that's inevitable and we shouldn't be afraid of the, of the word, word um, digital or, or, or AI or, or, or tech. We shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, we shouldn't run away from it. We have to embrace it. That's, that's the future, that's our future. Let's make sure that the future aligns with our uh, best values. And so we're gonna be more and more part of, the, of an AI ourselves. Um, there's nothing intrinsically bad with it. Um, it's different, it's new, it's challenging, but um, let's not be afraid of it. Let's embrace it, but let's stick to, to, to what we think are our most important ethical values and, 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 and let's try and make sure that the, um, the AI, the technology doesn't uh, kind of run away from us um, 
in a way it's let's avoid that's what i'm worried about the most let's avoid to be let's try not to be too late uh, let's avoid the, the the case in which the ai is so developed and so far uh, into the in the process that we can't really um, put any constraint on it uh, and, and that yeah that because that will be that will be terrible i think the uh, the next question um, has a small small uh, preamble, so I'll, I'll say that and then the question. During this COVID pandemic, many countries use tracing apps and other data, cell phones, credit cards, CCTV, etc., to track and prevent the spread. The public reaction has been very mixed, and the results also differ from place to place. How is the field of ethics of tech participating in or commenting on these processes? So good, that's uh, fantastic. So um, COVID apps, uh, for instance, have been, have been really been part of the conversation in the, in the ethics of AI space. So there are of course a number of different um, problems, one of them being privacy. So privacy is definitely a concern when it comes um, to, um, to the use of, of this kind of technology that are gonna track you in some, some ways, gonna get information from you and so on and so forth. And here you have the typical sort of scenario of an ethical dilemma. On the one hand, you want to ensure the right of privacy, make sure that people's, uh, people's information is not uh, divulged. On the other hand, you, you also want uh, want to ensure wellness and, and, and well-being. Um, so eliminating COVID, COVID would, be, would be definitely sort of advisable and, and, and good. So you got, you got an ethical dilemma here. So that's how the, the ethics of AI space and ethics of AI um, ecosystem has looked at as this problem. I mean, the, as, as, as we, any of these problems, what we need is also some some kind of practical solutions. So we want to ensure privacy. There are ways to ensure privacy. Um, there are laws uh, can, that can be used and can be passed to, to ensure even more privacy. Um, there are tech, technical tools that can be used uh, to at least ensure uh, some, some privacy for, for people's data. So it's not like we are like, ah, there's nothing you can do. There, there are ways, there are ways we can there are, there are tools that we can use uh, to, to reach our goal. But we shouldn't lose uh, sight of the fact that it's always gonna be a dilemma. It's always gonna be um, a trade-off between different ethical needs and principles and values. That's, I mean, that's, that's something new, it's nothing like, it's not part of AI. It's not an intrinsic component of AI necessarily, it's just part of a human, the human uh, sort of condition that we're gonna be faced, we're gonna, we're gonna face situations in which we're gonna to have to choose between competing values. And, um, and that, definitely the COVID situation uh, has, uh, has put us in, in, in definitely in, in, a, in a sort of um, scenario in which different values uh, have, um, dif have, impor have importance and, and we have just to figure out ways to do our best to make sure that there is privacy, but also that there is that we can find ways to to get rid of COVID. So, the next question then is from Thomas Young, and uh, he asks, "Do you believe AI can be ethical under capitalism, or that it would be easier to achieve uh, under another economic system?" Oh, okay, that's a ha, that's a difficult question. Um, hmm. I, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought about this. I think that will be part of the things that uh, that we need to think more about. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily see uh, AI linked to a specific economic system. There are however, definitely differences of how AI can be used in different political systems. So there are gonna be, and there are, political system, political situations 
in which AI is used um, in a very unethical way to limit people's freedom, to be, limit people's autonomy. And, uh, and we should not shut up about it. We actually should condemn those, those uses. Um, whether that has to do with the economy, I don't know. To be honest, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna be open with you. I'm not sure. But definitely AI has huge political implications and, and of that we need to be very, very aware of. The next question then is from Elijah Snow Rackley and uh, he says, some discourse around tech focuses on data ownership and centralization. Do you have any thoughts on the network effect or ethics surrounding the centralization of core infrastructure, parentheses, platforms? Uh, sorry, let me see. Oh, I don't see here in the chat. So can you repeat it like briefly? Do you mind, sorry. <clears throat> sure, sure. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the network effect or ethics surrounding the centralization of core infrastructure platforms? Mm. Focusing on data ownership and centralization. Yeah. No, I do not have a view on them. Um, however, I do think that centralization is usually problematic when it comes to data collection. So the more centralized um, a system of data is, the more um, worrisome are the possible uses that can be um, done of, 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 of those data. So, I, although I do not have a worked out view on this, I, I mostly have worries about the idea of centralization. I think that especially privacy um, is best served when we do not have a centralized system. Um, that has been shown, for instance, for um, the COVID app that I was referring to uh, before, in which um, at least there are good reason for thinking a and, and a not centralized um, data collection is actually more, more helpful. Yeah. And then, uh, at least in the chat right now, the final question is, Often these guidelines and regulations framed are too general while the implementation of AI tech in different domains pose different challenges and ethical dilemmas. Is there a way to resolve this? Yeah, so this is what I was referring to before. That that's possibly the most difficult thing to resolve at the moment. And a lot of people are talking about uh, how we're gonna implement this, this principles. This is, uh, this is hard. So um, one thing that we need to, to think about is that one of the, challenge, the challenges of implementation, I, I think, at least for AI, is context sensitivity. The fact that uh, the same technology can affect different communities, for instance, in different ways. Okay? Some communities may actually turn out to be better off because of a certain technology, but whereas others may be harmed. Okay? So here's you get a problem of, okay, then is the technology good or bad? Well, depends, right? Depends uh, who is affected by it. So, so that gives you an idea of how difficult it is to implement uh, general principles. That said, it's always difficult to implement eth ethical principles. It's not like it's, not like it's just about uh, AI ethics. That it is, for any kind of ethics, it is hard to find out exactly what I got to do in this particular situation, given a broad principle or a general principles that is given to me. So in general, it is hard to find out how to implement, um, to implement this theoretical system into an actual sort of, to actual practical cases. So in general, it is hard. So some people um, in the, in the, eth in the philosoph philosophical sort of world, I thought that maybe we do not have to implement ethical principles. Ethical principles or maybe rough guidelines, but what we need is that look at the situation, look at the case, and and sort of figure out what's the right thing to do um, given the given the the actual circumstances we are facing. Okay, 
So it's not that in philosophy it's lost on people that 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 practice and 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 can't it's it's desired that, that, that there are contextual matters. So it, it's not lost on, on on philosophy at all. It gets a little trickier for for ethics uh, of AI because of what I mentioned before. Technology and AI in particular they are used everywhere and can affect people in very different ways. And you but you still have to kind of find this make a decision about the AI system itself. So again, I don't know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry, I do not have any, any, any obvious way to, to solve this problem. Um, but I think that the sort of the solution that I propose at the end, you gotta make the public more informed. So they put pressure on the system, the legal system, but also on, on, on companies. And companies need to uh, be held accountable. And, and there's gotta be an audit system that at least um, raises some of the issues that we, are, that we worry about. And an audit system may actually be one, at least one of the tools at our disposal to make sure that in practice, the systems, the AI systems we are developing are, are fair, just, and, and so on and so forth. Um, well, Thank you very much. And if you have time for one more question, I uh, have 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 one. Um, so if there's going to be this, uh, let's say a philosophical education for people who end up working either as auditors or in um, creating some sort of decentralized position, let's take the premise that we would rather have uh, philosophers who work with technology versus technicians who have some vague understanding of philosophy. That being said, what do you think you would uh, want to be sort of some central ideas that those people take with them as, as thinkers working with tech? So as lovers of knowledge working with technology. Uh, I, I, by the way, I think that it would be good to, to also have some ethical training for, for developers and, and, and designers. So, like, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that they should be taken out of the picture at all. Um, they are... I mean, at the end of the day, those are the guys and, and girls who are actually, you know, uh, writing codes and, and, and doing the hard work. So I think they need to be at least aware that there is an ethical, that there could be ethical issues with what they're, what they're doing and designing. So I think that some level of um, ethical awareness should be, should be part of the conversation, even when it comes to developers and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so definitely that's, that's important. I also, I agree with you that there's, there also needs to be a body that somehow, or at least a group of people, could be philosophers, uh, I hope so, but definitely also other people that could help these companies and these developers and, 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 and so all, all this group of people, sorry, but like they could help them develop good AI systems. If I were to give, to um, to offer a suggestion for those group of for that group of people, I would also add something that I haven't really touched upon today, but I think is as important. Um, it's not just about ethics. I know that like while well, you talked about ethics all the time, why you're now not saying the opposite? But bear with me for a second. Um, philosophy is a very um, comprehensive sort of discipline. We do ethics, but we do all, also other things like epistemology, the study of knowledge, we study the mind and so on and so forth. If you want to do a good ethics of technology and AI in particular, you kind of also need to take into account that it's, that it's, not, just, it's not just about ethics and moral theories. There are, gonna, there are, there are issues that um, are part of developing a good AI system that have to do also with other parts of philosophy, not just ethics. And by, by, by that, I mean, there also have to be, there has to be a conversation about the epistemology of AI, what it means to know thanks to an AI system, for instance, what it means for a doctor to know that someone has cancer based on what the AI says, for instance. Um, we need to have a conversation about the mind, what it means to have a mind and how, for instance, technology can read our minds uh, and, and make assessments about our mental health, for instance. That, that's, that's something that people have been talking about a lot lately. 
We need a philosophy of mind for that. So actually, so what I'm going to say is that we need more philosophy, not just ethics. We actually need all that very deep reflection on the human mind and uh, on human beings in general to make a good, trustworthy AI system. So I guess that's, that's, uh, that's my final thought. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank